Okay, so chapter 13. Um, we really go more in depth in the cere um, cerebrum later on. Okay. Dicephalon, we talk about this later on. A lot of these we are going to go more in depth on. You should have an idea of the general structure, but again, we talk more in depth about this later on. Let's start this with talking about how does the central nervous system protect itself. Okay, remember the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. The idea here is we want to perform a protective shell around the brain. And this protective shell is, two, is, is a multi-part system. First, we want to protect it from pathogens, right? We want to protect it from chemicals getting into it. Okay, that comes to the blood-brain barrier. We want to physically protect it from injury. That's the skull. That's going to have a hard shell protection around it. And we also want to protect it, you know, if, if it's in the skull, we want to give a buffer for it, right? That's the meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid surrounding it. But it's a multi-layer protective system, both from physical injury and pathogen attack and attack from chemicals. Okay, we'll talk more about this as we progress, but that's the idea here is we are talking about how do we protect the central nervous system. You should know what the meninges are, and this is a multi-layer structure surrounding the skull or the brain and the spinal cord. Know what the meninges are. For the test, you should know the order of the meninges, okay, from the outermost layer to the innermost layer. Not only should you know this, you should know, well, first of all, let me start with this. Three of these are actual layers, and two of these are spaces, okay? We start with the outer dura mater, <clears throat> we move toward the arachnoid mater, then we, uh, in the inner part, we have the pia mater. Between these two, the subdural and the subarachnoid, you should know those, and you should know the fluids that are in those spaces. The subdural space is going to have interstitial fluid, the subarachnoid will have um, cerebrospinal fluid. So know the order. Be aware of the order of the regions and be aware of the space between the regions and know the fluids that circulate through those spaces. Subdural is going to have interstitial, subarachnoid will have cerebrospinal fluid. So now we're going to start with the dura mater, and we're going to, what we're going to do is in the next several slides, we're going to progressively go from the outermost to the innermost. Okay. <clears throat> dura mater is the outermost layer of the meninges, and this is a very dense, thick layer, very physically strong layer. Specifically with the dura mater, um, that a hematoma is where blood is trapped on the brain tissue. And you can describe a hematoma based on its location relative to the dura mater. Okay, if it's an epidural hematoma, that is above the dura mater. If it's below the dura mater, it's a subdural hematoma. Okay, so it's just a, a you're going to hear this a lot in medical terminology, is hematomas and these types. That is what it's referring to. If it's below or above the dura mater, okay? Know both of these. <clears throat> now, surrounding the spine, you have the dural sheath, and this is part of the dura mater, and this forms a, again, a protective area around the uh, spinal cord. Kind of important is with um, epidural anesthetics. This is where um, anesthetics are applied to. You're going to see this, for example, when people are going in for childbirth. They'll give them an epi or an epidural uh, injection. This is where they're injecting into. Next layer is the arachnoid mater. Okay. Not as thick, not as, as strong as the dura mater. Okay. Made of simple squamous epithelium. And the reason it's the retinoid, you know, retinoid spider, is it has a web-like appearance. 
Now, remember I said there's a region between the arachnoid and dura mater? That is the subdural space, and this is filled with interstitial fluid. Now, below the arachnoid mater, between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, we have what? The subarachnoid space, and this is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. For the test, you should know what the region below and above the retinoid mater is and what type of fluid fills it. Okay. Finally, the innermost layer, the pia mater, this is a very thin layer, not very physically strong. Think of it almost like as a rubber glove surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. Look at its location, and this is a great picture to show the location. Look how it is, it's almost this, this cellophane wrapper surrounding the brain, okay? Now, new, new topic, new topic is blood flow to the brain. We went over the, uh, layers before the brain. Now we're going to talk about how does blood get to the brain. Okay. Blood always has to flow to and from the brain, obviously, right? Because the brain is made of neurons and neural glial cells, and these are essentially cells, right? So we have got to give it oxygen. We have got to give it nutrients. Another important thing here is that it takes a lot of energy. Remember we talked about the sodium potassium pumps or the sodium potassium things and, and neurons, right? Well, do those gradients build themselves? Well, the answer to that question is no, they do not build themselves. They don't magically, you know, appear as a gradient. We have to have pumps, sodium potassium pumps working to restore those gradients. So what's the point? Well, that takes energy. That takes cellular energy to build those gradients. Meaning that if the neurons are firing, what do we have to do? We have to provide energy to the brain, a disproportionate amount of energy to the brain, in order to get those sodium potassium pumps functioning. Okay, so the brain for its size uses a large amount of energy of the body. And again, that all goes back to maintaining the gradients of sodium potassium chlorine. And we saw why we need that, right? That the movement of those ions moves an electrical or an impulse, sends a message, neurotransmitters release uh, at the end. But we build those gradients by active transport, and we need ATP for that, meaning that we need to get a source of energy to the cells in the brain. Okay. So lots of reasons why the brain needs a flow of blood. It needs oxygen and it needs nutrients because it's doing a lot of metabolism. Why is building those gradients we talked about before? So again, obviously there needs to be blood and nutrients to the brain. And it needs a constant supply of blood. If you cut oxygen off to a, a body part, you know, it will survive a, a short amount of time. Okay, then, you know, it will have necrosis and, and you'll have to have it removed. But if you cut blood flow off to the brain, you know, you can't, you can, you cannot cut blood and oxygen off to the brain for a long period of time. A few seconds, you're having problems. Prolonged periods where you don't have oxygen and blood to the brain, it's much more sensitive than other tissue. That's kind of the point here. And again, a short period of time, a few minutes, you're having problems. A few seconds even, you, you're, you obviously are going to have problems with uh, consciousness, right? But the point is, key point, is the brain is much more sensitive to a decrease in blood flow and oxygen than is other parts of the body. Okay. Now, one of the main protective functions that protects the brain is the blood-brain barrier. And here's the idea. We've said that the brain needs blood, right? Obviously. But here's the problem. Here's the conundrum. How do we make sure the brain gets blood, but then we somehow we, we strain the blood of pathogens, right? Bacteria can go in blood we make sure there's chemicals contained within blood, right? We don't want those chemicals to get into the brain. 
we want to make sure the brain gets a pure supply of blood that is not tainted with pathogens, with chemicals. And that's where the blood-brain barrier comes in. What is it? I'll just read the definition. A barrier consisting of specialized brain capillaries, right, that's going to carry the blood, and astrocytes. Where do we remember astrocytes? Those come under what? Neural glial cells. These are going to prevent the passage of materials from the blood to the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. Okay. Um, going back to the previous chapter, we talked about astrocytes and neural glial cells. Refer to that. We said there's lots of functions to the astrocytes. If you go back and look at those notes and compare it to this, you will see the uh, crossover. But the point is this, that the blood-brain barrier protects the brain from harmful substances and pathogens. Point here is that many but not all, okay? Blood-brain barrier protects from harmful substances and, path and pathogens, but not every single one. Still some pathogens can pass through. It's not a 100% lock. For the test, no these two points. One, it protects from most pathogens and harmful substance, and two, it's not a foolproof barrier. Okay, It is not a hundred percent surefire lock. Some things can get through. Pathogens, you know those as, um, for example, mad cow um, disease or spongy form encephalopathy, um, kuru, a couple other ones. Things can get through the blood-brain barrier. It's not a perfect um, system. Again, astrocytes are important here. What cannot pass, what does not pass the blood-brain barrier? Most, usually polar molecules have a very hard time getting past the blood-brain barrier. Immune cells, again, they are not going to pass the blood-brain barrier. Now, HIV, other things, can actually use this to their advantage and hide out Okay, and the brain because they can hide from the immune cells. What does pass the blood-brain barrier? Um, glucose, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide. I don't expect you to memorize this entire list. What I want you to at least know is what the major ones is glucose, right? The brain needs energy, it needs glucose. Oxygen, right? We need oxygen. Carbon dioxide, because, you know, the brain's doing metabolism, right? So it's got to get rid of carbon dioxide. Um, alcohol, that's another one you might want to know. Okay. Now, I mentioned this. This is just more of an FYI, just to show you that blood-brain barrier permeability does have some clinical aspects. I don't expect you to memorize the Lenovo dopa and the dopamine just know that, you know, there are some clinical aspects of the blood-brain barrier, but I don't expect you to memorize this specific example. Just more of an FYI for you. Okay, cerebrospinal fluid. Now, we said that between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, we have that region where cerebrospinal fluid is found. This is a fluid that is circulating throughout the uh, spinal cord and around the brain. Know what cerebrospinal fluid is and know its function. And it's essentially a carrier, right? It's going to carry nutrients to the brain, right? If as it comes out of the blood-brain barrier, well, it has to somehow get oxygen, to the brain, you have to get glucose to the brain, you've got to get um, uh, carbon dioxide away from the brain. The cerebrospinal fluid is the medium between the brain and the body that allows the passage of these molecules. Okay, that's the point, right? It's a medium of exchange, it allows these molecules to pass from um, the blood to the brain and then from the brain out. Okay. Now, cerebrospinal fluid is not stationary. It's always circulating around. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But just know that it is not a, a static uh, 
entity. It is moving around. Okay. Just some functions. You know, I expect you to know this mechanical protection, chemical protection. These are these are self-explanatory. Won't go too much into this. Now the ventricles, new kind of topic. New topic here is now we're going to talk about how do we produce cerebrospinal fluid. It's important for the test that you know, have an idea of how we form cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. We start with the ventricles and these are the chambers that will produce cerebrospinal fluid. And there are three types of chambers of which there are four. Okay, by that I mean that there are two lateral ventricles, a third ventricle and a fourth. There are two laterals, one third and one fourth. Okay, so the ventricles of the brain, you should know those, the order and how many of each of them there are. Okay, so again we have two lateral ventricles, we have one third ventricle and we have one fourth ventricle. Add them all together, we have four. And again, before we get too far into this, what we're covering is where cerebrospinal fluid is made, how cerebrospinal fluid is made, and the pathway at which it is formed. That's the topic of the next several slides. Okay, so we're going to start on the outermost part, the lateral ventricles, and we have two of these. Okay, this is where cerebrospinal fluid is made. Now each of these ventricles, the lateral, the third and fourth, have a chordate plexus in them. Okay, and this is going to be, these plexuses are going to be the location where cerebrospinal fluid is made from the blood. Okay, a little bit more on that later on. But each of these ventricles will have a series of chordate plexuses where cerebrospinal fluid is made. Okay, so we have a lateral ventricle, we have a third ventricle, and we have a fourth ventricle. Okay. Now I said that all of these ventricles have these chordate plexuses at them. So how does a chordate plexus work? So we have something that looks kind of like an onion in the center and then a kind of a U-shape. Okay. Bring your attention to that word epidemal cell. Where have we seen epidemal cell before? Well, if you said neuroglial cell, you are correct. That is a type of glial or neuroglial cell. Okay, so starting at the upper left-hand corner in that red, dark red pathway, blood is going to go through the blood capillary. What is a major component of blood? Well, that's water, fluid, right? So as blood goes through the blood capillary, the epidemal cells around here will, by active transport, pull out water and key nutrients and key molecules from the blood and as it pulls those out it will then direct those to inside the brain at those ventricles. Okay, So this structure you see here is present at all of these ventricles. So all of these ventricles, the lateral, the third and fourth, each have a series of chordate plexuses at them. At the chordate plexus, blood goes through the capillary. And as blood goes through the capillary, the water of the blood, nutrients, some key ions, are pulled out selectively by the epidemal cells. Okay, now, notice we have tight junctions. Why is that important? That is important because this will make sure the only way fluid can leave the blood capillary and go into the brain is by the selective permeability of those epidemal cells because they will regulate what is taken out of the blood. If we didn't have tight junctions here, this thing would be leaky and anything from the blood could enter the brain. But we've said before that we want, it's a highly regulated event what gets into the brain, right? By the presence of these epidemal cells and those tight junctions, we selectively regulate what leaves the blood and goes into the brain. What goes? What what do we pull out of the blood? Fluid, you know, water, key ions, and some other um, molecules. Okay. But the point is, what comes out of here? What comes out of here 
is cerebrospinal fluid. So if you could think of lines emanating from this structure, those lines would be cerebrospinal fluid. Where does that fluid come from? It comes from the blood because blood is moving through the capillary. Now let's say there's something in the blood we don't want in the brain. Can it get out? No, it can't because those tight junctions between the epidemal cells protect things from leaving that blood capillary. Okay? And that's kind of the point. Now, all of the four ventricles have a series of chordate plexuses at them. The lateral ventricle, the two of those we have, they have a series of chordate plexuses. The third and fourth ventricle also have these chordate plexuses at them. And each of them will have blood moving through them. Each of them will pull off fluid and key ions and molecules from that and bring it into the brain. Okay, And when it brings it into the brain, we are forming cerebrospinal fluid. Now, the epidemal cells are joined by tight junctions. Going back to AMP1, remember we had tight junctions and that was like a waterproof barrier between cells? Stuff can't get past those tight junctions. It's like welds. You, it, it is sealed with super glue, whatever type of adhesive you want to think of. Between those individual epidemal cells, movement cannot happen. Meaning the only way, the only way something can get out of the blood capillary and into the brain is through passing through an epidemal cell, and that's a regulated action, okay? That is a regulated event. Those things decide what comes out. And the reason, you know, pathogens, other things cannot fit between those epidemal cells is because we have tight junctions between those individual cells, Okay, that contributes to the selectivity of the system. And again, those tight junctions are the basis of the system. When making it, it these epidemal cells, which are the glial cells, those control what leaves the blood and what enters as cerebrospinal fluid. Now this picture is the one I believe in your book about the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. For the test, you could use this if you really want to. It is an accurate picture. But um, Salden, another AMP book, I'm using some of their uh, photography, some of their images. They have a slightly different um, di uh, picture of this, and I, I, I like their picture a little bit better. Now this is accurate. Let's start at the very top. We have lateral ventricle chordate plexuses, right? What comes out of there? Cerebrospinal fluid winds up in the lateral ventricles, okay? That cerebrospinal fluid then moves to the third ventricle. That third ventricle is, is, gets its cerebrospinal fluid from its chordate plexus. So the cerebrospinal fluid from the lateral ventricle mixes with the cerebrospinal fluid from the third ventricle, and that forms... A, a mix of cerebrospinal fluid, and that moves to the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle receives cerebrospinal fluid from its ventricle plexus, um, excuse me, its chordate plexus, and all of that mixes, and then that cerebrospinal fluid goes to the subarachnoid space. Remember, that's the space between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, and it then circulates throughout surrounding the brain. Okay? Ultimately, that will be removed and continuously replaced with more cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, now that is an accurate diagram, but we're going to use. Oh, oh, one last point here. After the cerebrospinal fluid has passed through, right, it has to be reabsorbed. And this is done at the retinoid villi um, near the top of the uh, longitudinal fissure of the brain. Okay. This is the image I think I, I like this image better. Okay, I it is a more of a di diagrammatical image. The last one I had is also accurate, but this is this I like this image better. 
Okay, so let's start at number one. Is it in the center, right? We have what? The uh, lateral ventricles, and those have that chordate plexus, right? And that's the chordate plexus at the two lateral ventricles are secreting or releasing cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, and that's going to move through the lateral ventricles and at the concurrent what's happening is the third ventricle also has what those chordate plexuses and those are also releasing what cerebrospinal fluid so the cerebrospinal fluid from the lateral ventricles combines with the cerebrospinal fluid from the third ventricle and forms a mix of the two okay so now our cerebrospinal fluid at Position three and four is made of cerebrospinal fluid made where? At the two lateral ventricles and at the third ventricle. Okay, so we progress through. It moves to the fourth ventricle. Let me say it this way. The cerebrospinal fluid made at the um, two lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, right, we have a mix of that. All of that cerebrospinal fluid moves to the, cere the area close to the fourth ventricle, and that too is making cerebrospinal fluid, and that combines to make cerebrospinal fluid from multiple chordate plexuses, some from the lateral ventricles, some from the third ventricle, some from the fourth ventricle. Okay. That cerebrospinal fluid, now we've got cerebrospinal fluid. What do you have to see from this? One, cerebrospinal fluid was produced at those, the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. Two, what produced them? Chordate plexus. Three, what went into chordate plexus? What, what was the originating uh, fluid? That was blood that went through the capillary and the epidemal cells selectively pulled out the fluid, some specific ions, to make cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, now we've got our mix of cerebrospinal fluid. Now it's going to enter the subarachnoid space, right? And that's the space between the arachnoid mater and the um, pia mater. Okay? And it's going to enter that space and circulate around the brain. And it will bathe the external surfaces of the brain and the spinal cord. And that cerebrospinal fluid will be a a medium of sorts to allow the exchange of molecules and ions between the brain and the exterior body. Finally, after the cerebrospinal fluid is done, this, these, these, you know, it, ha it is replaced. It's always being replaced. It will be reabsorbed. Okay. For the test, you should have an idea of the uh, pathway at which cerebrospinal fluid is produced. Now, sometimes the production of cerebrospinal fluid, right, there is a reabsorption and there is a production. But sometimes there can be abnormalities that interfere with the reabsorption. Okay, and if someone does have this, they have to have a shunt and they have, you have to physically drain away excess cerebrospinal fluid. Typically, this can come as, for example, a tube running down the neck and into the, into the body, and you physically have to pull off a little bit of that cerebrospinal fluid over time. Okay, so now we're going to move to regions of the brain. Now, there's a lot here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to kind of cover different areas um, progressing from the outermost to the innermost, okay? From the most developed to the more basal functions. So we're going to start with the cerebrum, but before we begin, again, there's several schemes, several ways of looking at this. Some books will say this is the function, some books will say this is the area, okay? So don't, don't get too wrapped around it. Different people present this differently. So the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the large, for the test you should know what the cerebrum is, and again, the cerebrum is where all of our upper thought happens, okay? Essentially, what gives you your personality? <clears throat> what makes you you, if you will, 
a lot of this is focused in the cerebrum. Okay? You can damage the cerebrum and still live because if your brain stem is functioning and your cerebellum is functioning, these are going to take care of a lot of your basal functions, your underlying functions. Okay, but the cerebrum is where your thought, your, your processing happens, right? Your keeping homeostasis, things like that, doesn't really happen as much in the cerebrum. It happens in your brain stem. Okay, we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, so the lobes, you have to, I'll just go through this fairly fast. You have to know the lobes of the brain and the different functions of the lobes. Okay. So the frontal lobe, key point here is its voluntary motor function. Parietal, that's going to do sensory reception. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Occipital, major function is vision. Temporal, that's going to mainly be with hearing. Okay. We talked about some of the structural terms to the brain. Okay, we're going to go over each one of these terms, but these are specific structural terms and structural areas of the cerebrum. We're still on the cerebrum, right? We just talked about the lobes of the cerebrum. Now we're going to talk about some specific structural terminology applied to the cerebrum. Okay. Cerebral cortex, this is the outermost region. Think of this as almost like an orange peel. Okay. It's not the entire outer part, it's not the entire part, it's just the outer region of it. It's gray matter, means not non-myelinated. This picture is a good picture, the blue. Okay, is the cortex. The neocortex, you'll hear this sometimes. Neocortex and cortex are slightly different. The outermost part of the cortex is the neocortex. Okay. Um, it's neo because it's relatively new in um, evolutionary terms. The next is the gyrus. We're going to talk about two of the gyrus, the postcentral and the precentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus is the primary motor area of the cerebral cortex. So what does that mean? That means that the neurons that go to different regions of the body, the face, the mouth, the tongue, multiple regions are pre-mapped along the precentral gyrus. Okay, so look at that central picture, right? We have this blue, and it's going up. We have a, you know, hand, foot, arm, all that stuff. Okay, think of that picture and turn it about 90 degrees and see that blue line or that blue region on the far right picture, that precentral gyrus? Okay, that's what it's showing, that the neurons leading to those locations are pre-mapped to specific regions on the precentral gyrus. Okay. Um, notice the amount of the contribution to the different areas. Your hands here are, you know, larger than, say, your arm. And that is intentional because, you know, you have more muscles in your hand, so obviously you're going to have more motor neurons leading from the precentral gyrus than, say, your upper arms. Okay? So for the test, know what the precentral gyrus contains and functions and this is the primary motor area. Postcentral gyrus, where is this? This is on the parietal lobe, front of the parietal lobe. This same idea here, okay, this idea of homoculus, this idea where regions are pre-mapped along the side of the gyrus. Here, though, instead of it going to motor neurons, this location is receiving information from afferent neurons throughout the body, right? So, and again, the idea that it is pre-mapped to a particular location along the cerebrum. Same idea also applies to the amount coming to these locations is based on the amount of sensor or the amount of uh, afferent neurons, not the amount of, not, not size, Okay, so for example, the face 
is disproportionately represented here because, again, there are more um, afferent neurons with the face than there would be on your arm. Same thing with your hands. Okay, so for the test, know what the postcentral gyrus is and that idea that, you know, it is pre-mapped and that the amount dedicated to a particular region is dependent on how many afferent neurons come from that region. Okay? Fissure. The major one we talked about was that longitudinal fissure, and that separates the cerebrum. Okay. Sulc uh, sulcus. Um, we talked about three of those. Just know which ones they are. Okay. Okay, so now the cerebral white matter, new topic. You guys can read this for yourself. But again, what the whole idea here is this stuff is going to connect different areas and allow them to communicate. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, association tracks are going to connect different um, areas of the same hemisphere. Okay, one air, um, part in the left hemisphere to another part in the left hemisphere. Um, now we're going to talk about cerebral white matter, new topic. The white matter main focus is the communication between different regions of the hemispheres. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, there are three types of tracks. You should know for the test the three types and what they do. Okay, association, we're going to connect areas in the same hemisphere. Now, remember we said there are different lobes, right? Well, if you're connecting two areas of the same lobe, it's short. If you're connecting different lobes, it's long. Okay, fairly straightforward. Know the function of them. Commissural tracks, these are going to connect the corresponding areas of the opposing cerebral hemispheres. Now, the one you've probably heard of in lab, and the most common example of this, is the corpus callosum. Okay, you've heard this, I'm sure, multiple times in lab. This is, going, this is the main connection point between the two hemispheres. Third is a projection track, and this is going to con convey information from the brain to the body. Okay, it's going to contain the neurons that can take the information from the brain and convey that to areas in the body. Basal nuclei. Okay, just know the definition of that. The limbic system. There's a lot to the limbic system. We're not going to go over every single point of it. Okay. Um, know the function of the limbic system. Okay. Campus. Okay, this is what I want to get to. The functional areas of the brain. And again, remember we, we talked, we've already kind of talked about this when we talked about the gyrus, right? The precentral, postcentral gyrus. Well, now we're going to talk about them not as a location, but as a function. Now, I'm not going to go over every single point here because we've already covered those before this. The next is the gyrus. We're going to talk about two of the gyrus, the postcentral and the precentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus is the primary motor area of the cerebral cortex. So what does that mean? That means that the neurons that go to different regions of the body, the face, the mouth, the tongue, multiple regions are pre-mapped along the precentral gyrus. Okay, so look at that central picture, right? We have this blue, and it's going up. We have a, you know, hand, foot, arm, all that stuff. Okay, think of that picture and turn it about 90 degrees and see that blue line or that blue region on the far right picture, that precentral gyrus? 
Okay, that's what it's showing, that the neurons leading to those locations are pre-mapped to specific regions on the precentral gyrus. Okay, um, notice the amount of the contribution to the different areas. Your hands here are, you know, larger than, say, your arm. And that is intentional because, you know, you have more muscles in your hand, so obviously you're going to have more motor neurons leading from the precentral gyrus than, say, your upper arms, okay? So for the test, know what the precentral gyrus contains and functions, and this is the primary motor area. Postcentral gyrus, where is this? This is on the parietal lobe, front of the parietal lobe. This same idea here, Okay, this idea of homoculus, this idea of where regions are pre-mapped along the side of the gyrus. Here, though, instead of it going to motor neurons, this location is receiving information from afferent neurons throughout the body, right? So, and again, the idea that it is pre-mapped to a particular location along the cerebrum. Same idea also applies to the amount coming to these locations is based on the amount of sensor or the amount of uh, afferent neurons, not the amount of, not, not size, okay? So for example, the face is disproportionately represented here because again, there are more um, afferent neurons with the face than there would be on your arm. Same thing with your hands. Okay, so for the test, know what the postcentral gyrus is and that idea that, you know, it is pre-mapped and that the amount dedicated to a particular region is dependent on how many afferent neurons come from that region. Okay, fissure, the major one we talked about was that longitudinal fissure and that separates the cerebrum. Sulcus, uh, sulcus um, we talked about three of those. Just know which ones they are. Okay. And for these, just know their location. Okay. White matter. For the test, you should know the five sensory areas of the brain. And we're going to go over each of these. And a lot of these, you know, we have already covered and are fairly self-explanatory. primary somatosensory area. We have already talked about this with the postcentral gyrus. Okay, so I'm just going to skip past this. Um, again, this goes back to that thing I said initially that what you can describe it based on function and location. We talked about this already. Okay. Primary visual area, occipital lobe, auditory area, Temporal lobe kind of makes sense. Think of where the ears are. Gustatory area. Uh, for these on the test, just know the location and the function. Okay, that's that's pretty much all we went over with this. Okay, thalamus. Just know that this is a relay station. Okay, that's pretty much what it is. Um, what I'm more concerned you know about is the hypothalamus. This is a very important region. Now, I'm kind of holding back what, everything I want to say about the hypothalamus because it's very hard to talk about the hypothalamus without talking about the endocrine system. Okay, that's the hormone system. Uh, we will talk more about this later on. Okay, I'm going to try to restrict what I talk about to the uh, central nervous system, but understand that this is kind of like, it, it's hard to talk about the hypothalamus without talking about the endocrine system. So I'm gonna kind of pull back a lot of the things I wanna talk about and, and talk about this when it's appropriate with the endocrine system. But I do wanna give you kind of a rough overview of the hypothalamus. But for the test, no, the hypothalamus, major point here is this is the homeostatic control system of the body. Okay, and it's going to use hormones as a way to regulate the body. 
And again, we will talk about specific hormones when it's appropriate in the endocrine uh, section of the course. Major regulator of homeostasis. And when you see the hormones this releases and the effect of those hormones, this will become uh, very apparent. Now, sometimes, and, it, and this is where we get the idea of the endocrine hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will release hormones. Now, it depends on the pituitary gland, or the part of the pituitary, as to the effect of those hormones. In some cases, the hypothalamus will make hormones and take those, shunt them, if you will, uh, along modified neurons, to the posterior pituitary where they are released into the body. In other cases, the hypothalamus will release inhibiting or stimulating hypothalamic releasing hormones which will then go to the anterior pituitary and either stimulate the release of hormones or inhibit the release of hormones. Now we're not going to get into specific hormones um, here, prolactins one. You don't need to know that for this test because this test is not testing the endocrine system. But be aware that that is how the hypothalamus works, is it directs the release of hormones either through the pituitary or signals to the pituitary to release those hormones. Okay, for the test, let's just leave it at this, that the hypothalamus is the main homeostatic control system of the body. That's the first thing you should know. Two, it's going to use hormones as a way for regulation. Okay, it's going to use hormones as a way for regulation. Three, it's going to use the pituitary gland as its point of interface with the endocrine system. Okay, that's the main points for this test. Let's not, and we said in class, we're not going to worry about the nucleuses and, and the specific minutia on this. That's more of a discussion when we talk about this relative to the endocrine system. So for the test, you do not need to know any of the hormones released by the anterior or posterior pituitary. Okay, you don't need to know those hormones. But you should know what the hypothalamus does, that the, it goes hand in hand with the pituitary gland. And when we talk about the endocrine system, you're going to see that's a, that's a stepping off point for the rest of the body. Okay. Um, okay. Don't worry about the hormones here. Uh, we will talk about these with the endocrine system. Okay. But this is kind of a gray zone here that it's hard to talk about the brain without talking about the hypothalamus, but then you got to bring the endocrine into it. So for the test, let's just hold it at those points that I had mentioned before. And I kind of said this before, um, think of the hypothalamus as the brains of the operation and the pituitary as the muscle of the operation, if you want to use a, an analogy such as that. Um, we will discuss this more in the future, but for now, just know those points that I had uh, laid out. But uh, we will see these, and I'll probably use these similar slides when we talk about the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So you will see these definitely in the future, but it will make a lot more sense when we bring in the, in the endocrine system into the discussion. Okay. Pineal gland. Pineal gland secretes melatonin, and that is controlled in the regulation of... Uh, Cartesian rhythms are day night. Okay. So just know what the pineal gland does. Now, now we have up until now we have talked about upper brain functions, right? We talked well, not for the past few minutes, but we started this whole thing with talking about you know what the cerebrum does, right? Upper brain thought. Now we're we're moving down more to the basal functions of the body. So these are just, um, know the functions of these, but these are the, um, these are controlling the more basal base functions of 
the body. And you kind of see what's happening here. For example, the medulla oblongata, that's going to control uh, breathing, for instance, right? Um, that is more of a basal or base function of the body. Particular formation. So for the last part, just have, um, just go with what we said in class. We're not going too far in depth on the midbrain um, part. If you've got any questions, uh, please let me know before the test.